There's a quote that I have here that you said, Professor Sam Vaknin. When I was growing up, there was a stigma attached to having cancer. People were ashamed to have cancer as if having cancer was a choice, like, can I have a side of cancer? But of course, cancer is not a choice. And I have a surprise for you. Mental illness is not a choice. Just as we should not stigmatize people with cancer, we shouldn't stigmatize people with mental illness. To have a mental illness is not humiliating, it's not shameful, nor is it embarrassing. It's the absolute equivalent of having a physical disease. Admitting to it, confessing it, and coming clean about it allows you to leverage your mental illness to help countless millions of people. Can you please comment on that? Elaborate, please. Well, first of all, the distinction between mental and physical is dubious at best. It's all embedded in a template of wetware and hardware. It's most of it takes place in the brain. Some of it takes place in the guts. Um, we have a body to contend with. This body gives rise to a variety of ailments and dysfunctions and so on and so forth. Some of which we historically and maybe in an antiquated manner characterize as mental or psychological. Some of which we insist are biological and medical. But I think the distinction is spurious, is, is wrong. Everything is basically biological. The way we experience certain disorders is perceived as psychological. That's one thing. Um, the second thing is that diseases are rarely choices when it comes to what we call psychopathological or psychopathologies. Rarely choices. Whereas physical diseases sometimes are choices. For example, if, you, if you're a heavy smoker, you're choosing lung cancer, probably. So the irony is that physical diseases, in many cases, are choices, and yet they are never stigmatized. Whereas psychological diseases are rarely, if ever, choices, and they are stigmatized. And that is poss possibly because we perceive people with mental illness as de uh, deficient, deformed, defective somehow. Something is wrong with them. Something is wrong with them constitutionally. It's not an, an outcome of choice, but in, it's an outcome of infirmity of some kind. And now we tend to associate immediately uh, one deformity with another. If something is wrong with them in one level, on one level, in one sphere of life, in one realm, then probably something is wrong with them in other areas of life, in other realms. So we'd better stay away. We'd better stay away. We understand psychological disorders far less than we understand physical ones. So there is also the question of the unknown, the mysterious, the superstitious, the prejudicial, the atavistic, the primitive, etc., etc. Our knowledge of psycho psychopathologies is laughable, and I'm being charitable. Whereas our knowledge of, of medical, biological, physical diseases is more advanced. It's still laughable, but it's more advanced. So you have a confluence of all these. And the outcome is a conspiracy theory. And the conspiracy theory says, stay away from mentally ill people because you can never predict what they're going to do. And because they are bound to be involved in the dark side, they are privy to some black magic or, um, you know, and so better stay away. It's a primitive reaction. Can you explain how the book Malignant Self-Love came about? And just for people who are tuning in and who don't know you, you hold a PhD in physics, you have something called chronon field theory, which we'll talk about soon. And it presents time as an interaction or a force, as some people call it, mediated by, by particles called chronons. And you're also a current professor of psychology and of business management. Malignant self-love was the outcome of a personal crisis, which uh, led to the total disintegration of every aspect of my life. Um, I used to be a very prominent businessman and stockbroker and venture capitalist and entrepreneur and financial analyst and so on and so forth in my home country, which is Israel. And then I uh, was sentenced to prison for financial fraud, for securities fraud. I lost my wife. I lost my life. I lost all my wealth. And I was a very wealthy person. <laughs> To use a British understatement. 
And you lost all the wealth. All my wealth, yes. I lost my reputation. I lost everything. I lost my freedom. And I found myself hitting rock bottom. I found myself denuded and deprived of everything that constitutes identity. Because we tend to appropriate things, possessions, people in our lives, circumstances, our personal history, and so on and so forth. We put all of it together, and this forms our identity. And supposedly our identity is immutable. It's unchangeable. It's, it's a core. We call it core identity. But I've lost all these all these Lego parts, and I couldn't put my identity back together like Humpty Dumpty. Uh -huh. So I had, to, I had to review the quintessential question, who am I? Not necessarily what has happened to me, or how could I recover, or what has led to this even, but who am I? This was clear to me that uh, I ended up at the receiving end of a string of choices, and these choices reflected some essence, reflected something essential. And so I needed to, I needed to tackle this essence. I needed to tackle the quiddity of being myself and then go from there. And when I did this with the help of mental health professionals as well, I understood that I, I, I was told that I have narcissistic personality disorder. And then I went to do research from the confines of prison. I started the research in prison. I smuggled books in and smuggled books out. And I wrote, I wrote notes to candlelight at night. It was very romantic and very Hollywood-like. And at the end of this journey of self-discovery, I, I came to learn about narcissistic personality disorder. Mind you, it was a very, very new idea, very new concept. The very phrase narcissistic personality disorder has been coined by Heinz Kohut in 1974. So it's fresh. It's very fresh. It, it entered, it made its entry into the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual in 1980. And I'm talking about the 1980s. So there was no experience with this disorder, no knowledge. There were a few writings by Freud and Kohut and Kernberg and so on and so forth. But nothing serious. Lowen wrote a book. Nothing serious. No one knew what the heck is narcissistic personality disorder. I had to learn everything from scratch and I had to invent a whole new language to describe my internal experience and my impact on other people. I had to invent this language because there was no language, simply. I borrowed phrases and terms from ancient psychoanalytic literature. I borrowed the phrase narcissistic supply, for example. I invented new words, which are in common usage today, like somatic narcissus, cerebral narcissus, um, idealization, devaluation, this, uh, discard, this, this cycle, and so on and so forth. And uh, narcissistic abuse, I popularized the term in the 90s. I was the first to describe narcissistic abuse. And I was overwhelmed by the reactions. Uh, the reactions were surprisingly massive. We're talking about the inception of the internet, and I was able to put together six support groups with 250,000 people. That's when no one was on the internet. Uh -huh. It was like the very beginning of the thing. And there was 250,000 people. So I realized that I've touched a nerve. And that was the very beginning of this whole narcissistic abuse movement online, which today is out of control in many ways, <laughs> regrettably. This question of who am I occurred to you. Do you find that that is one that occurs to other people who are in your position or was there something different about your circumstance or your psychological makeup? I think in my case, the loss has been truly extreme. I have a propensity for intellectual pursuits. I studied to study at the university at age nine. So that shows you that I'm in love with, <laughs> with intellect and science and so, so forth. So my reflexive, my reflex was to study. I cope with life and I cope with the world by trying to encapsulate it and contain it in words. Words are my instruments and my, my liberation. It's a kind of liberation theology, but with words. And so I, I resorted to my default mechanism of study the problem, capture it in words. It's a kind of wild animal that you have to cage. And the cage is the verbiage. So 
that's what I did. I think most other narcissists are much more grounded in reality um, in this sense. They are much less, I think, intellectual, or, and they're much less curious. Narcissists are not curious because there's an underlying assumption that you're omniscient, that you know everything. Hmm. There's nothing to learn. Why waste the time? Everyone is inferior to you. You're intellectually superior. You're godlike, and so on and so forth. I've always been humble in the face of knowledge, uh, very arrogant and haughty in the face of people, but very humble when confronted with knowledge. And so I embarked on this journey that now, now is out of hand and encompasses tens of millions of people all over the world. But at the time I was alone. I was alone for 10 years. Between 1995 and 2004, there was one website on narcissism, mine. <laughs> And six support groups, all of them owned by me, and one book, mine, published in 1999. Is there any commonality in the big five with narcissists? And also, why don't you define what a narcissist is? Well, there have been many attempts to reduce narcissism to traits. So the big five factor, uh, factors, this is one attempt. There's another attempt, much more serious in my view. And that is the attempt by the Committee of the International Classification of Diseases, which is the diagnostic manual which competes with the DSM. The DSM is actually used only in the United States, Canada, and sometimes in the United Kingdom. <laughs> but the rest of the world does not use the DSM. The rest of the world uses another book published by the World Health Organization. And this book is called the ICD, and it's at its 11th edition. Now, in the ICD, for example, no, there's no narcissism. There's no narcissistic personality disorder. There's a confluence of several traits, for example, dissociality, antagonism, and, and so on and so forth, and, uh, 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 perfectionism. So there's a combination of traits that give rise to something that is recognizable as narcissism. So trying to reduce narcissism to a list of traits is one approach. Trying to reduce narcissism to a list of behaviors, as the DSM does, is another approach, trying to reduce narcissism to a literary text that describes the inner landscape and dynamics of the narcissist, is a third approach, and this is the approach in the alternative model in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. But none of them captures, captures I think, the essence of narcissism. You ask me, what is narcissism? It's not an easy question to answer, but I will I will take a stab at it. First of all, narcissism is a post-traumatic condition, with very few exceptions. People with narcissistic personality disorder, and even people with narcissistic style, which is not like the disorder, it's, a, it's narcissism light. These people have a background of what is known as adverse childhood experiences, ACEs. So they have a background of abuse and trauma uh -huh. in, in, um, in early childhood. Now, abuse is a very misleading word because immediately you have, you, it conjures up images of physical abuse, beatings, sexual abuse, incest, this, that. There are many, many forms of abuse. For example, if you instrumentalize the child to gratify your own needs and your own wishes as a parent, that's abusive. If you pedestalize the child, if you idolize the child, thereby preventing the child from any access to reality, that's abuse. If you parentify the child, if you force the child to act as your parent rather than the other hmm. way around, that's abuse. If you pamper and spoil the child, if you're overprotective and prevent the child from having any meaningful interactions with peers, peers of the child, that's abuse. There are numerous forms of abuse. But all narcissists, with extremely few exceptions, uh, share this background. And therefore, it's a post-traumatic condition, number one. Number two, uh, narcissists are unable to tell the difference between external and internal. In this sense, they are very reminiscent of psychotics. That's not some vaccine. That is Otto Kernberg. Yeah? They're very reminiscent of psychotics. It's, the direction is different. The psychotic confuses or conflates internal objects with external ones. Super interesting. This is called hyperreflexivity. While the narcissist 
confuses external objects with internal ones. So the psychotic is going to hear a voice. He's going to say the voice is coming from the outside when actually the voice is internal. So he confuses internal with external. The narcissist is going to meet someone and then convert that person into an internal object. So he confuses external with internal, while the psychotic confuses internal with external. But it's a mirror image of psychosis. Just to interrupt, I apologize. Would, the, would an example be, I heard Steve Jobs would hear other people's ideas, say no, but then one week later, he would go to that person and recite the idea as if he came up with it, and he would also believe he came up with it. Yes, that's an example. Now, I'm not saying Steve Jobs is a narcissist. I'm saying, would that be an example I of think, behavior? I think you could safely say that he was. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, that's an example, because the, as far as the narcissist is concerned, there are no external objects. Objects in psychology means people. There are no external people. Everyone is an internalized object in his mind, known as introject. Everyone is an introject. Everyone is an avatar, a representation in his mind. And external versus internal, is that also to be thought of as subject versus object? No, because the experience of the internal objects is subjective, even though the narcissist misidentifies the internal objects as external. So this is not the same as someone who does meditation and then they dissolve the boundary between subject and object? No. Another thing is that the narcissist does not possess an ego. Ironically, the narcissist is selfless. <laughs> the narcissism, Super interesting. <laughs> narcissism is a disruption in the formation of the self. It's very, it, it starts very early in life, and it has to do with the fact that the parent was unable to mirror the child appropriately. There was no maternal gaze which allowed the child to differentiate himself from or herself from the mother and create boundaries. So consequently, the child does not evolve um, a functioning ego or a self or what have you. So there's an emptiness there. There's a void. Kernberg described it in borderline and narcissistic uh, disorders that there's a void there. And so the narcissist is incapable of uh, perceiving external and, and differentiating it differentiating it from internal because there is what what i call an othering failure how do you know that other people exist when you were a small 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 baby mother looked at you there was a maternal gaze and you saw yourself in mother's eyes you were able to identify yourself in mother's eyes and then mother left the room she frustrated you as a baby as an infant, she left the room and her gaze left with her. Gradually, you begin to grasp as an infant that there is mommy and there is you. It's her gaze that defines you. And her gaze is the first catastrophic, cataclysmic trauma in life. It's very traumatic to realize that you and mother are not one, are not unitary. The world breaks apart. There is a chasm suddenly that opens up because mother represents the world. And now it's you against the whole world and you're not one. So you can't control the world, etc., etc. It's a major trauma. But it endows you with the ability to tell apart external and internal. It gives rise to what later becomes the constellated self. It allows you to develop boundaries. So you know, I stop here and the world begins here. Or the world stops here and I begin. All this is absent in narcissism, in pathological narcissism. The child never goes through these stages. He never separates, individuates. He's never allowed to separate from the parent, usually the mother, and to become an individual. And so narcissists spend an eternity trying to recreate the early childhood conflict, trying to separate individually. So they go around and they find maternal substitutes. They find intim intimate partners, friends, and they convert them into mothers, substitute mothers. 
And then they try to separate from them and become individuals because they failed originally. Hmm. And this is known in psychology as a repetition compulsion. That's in a nutshell. I mean, it's a lot more complicated, but in a nutshell. So let's say we have an extreme narcissist. Let's call them Carl. And you ask Carl, Carl, does Alex exist? You point to Alex. Would Carl say, no, Alex does not exist? Or maybe they would appease you and say yes, but inside they would feel as if no, no, Alex... No, they, no, they miss, as I said, they miss, misapprehend internal objects. They think they're external. This is why narcissism is a kind of psychosis. They first, they first deprive you of your externality and your separateness. Because narcissists never succeeded to separate from the maternal figure. They don't know what it means to be separate. They've never had an experience of separateness. So whenever they come across someone, they immediately merge, fuse. They go into what is called a symbiotic phase. So they can't tell that you're separate, that you're external. They regard you as an extension of them, of themselves, or internal object or avatar or icon or whatever you want to call it. But they mislabel this, this internal object and they, they say that it's external. In other words, they have what we call impaired reality testing. They don't grasp reality appro appropriately. They get reality wrong. <laughs> they misread reality and mislabel everything. They mislabel their own emotions. They mislabel internal objects. They, it's a total case of extreme attribution errors, you know. So they are very, very confused. Narcissism, I think, the core of narcissism is enormous confusion. Enormous confusion. Because you don't have guidance from inside because you don't have insides. You're hollow. Hollow. You're a void. Do they lack a conscience? No, no. There's no, nothing, nothing there. It's total emptiness. So they do lack a conscience? Conscience is a, a, a group of introjects that are embedded in you, installed in your mind, if you wish, during a process known as socialization. Conscience reflects society's values and mores communicated to you via socialization agents such as mother and father. You imitate mother and father. This is known as social learning, social learning theory. You, you imitate, emulate mother and father. They become role models. And later you have teachers and peers, you know, influencers even. They become role models. So conscience is simply a name given to a voice or a group of voices that reflect society in you. Societies, society reaches into your mind. There's a long arm of society and installs an app. And this app is conscious. Mm. Narcissists, of course, do not possess a conscience because to possess a conscience you must, number one, realize that there are people out there, external people. Number two, you need to have a functioning ego. Ego is a word used by Freud. I'm not saying that ego is a real thing. It's a metaphor. Ego simply means that you grasp reality properly. You realize the consequences of your actions. You can tell right from wrong and you orient your behavior according to this information. So ego is like the interface with reality. And uh, that's one of the functions of the ego. It has many other functions. But one of one most important ones is to put you in touch with reality. When you want to do something, to tell you, wait a minute, hold it. It's going to have dire consequences. Don't do it. This is conscience. Or what you're doing is wrong. You're hurting people. And it's wrong to hurt people. This is conscience. Narcissus doesn't have any of this because he doesn't perceive that other people exist. Because he doesn't have an ego. Because he has no, in, no interface or exchange or intercourse with reality, he lives in a fantastic bubble. Narcissism is a fantasy defense writ large. Even the opening text in the DSM uses the word fantasy. It's a fantasy. The narcissist lives in what is known as a paracosm, a virtual reality. It's the first virtual reality long before computers. <laughs> Can you disentangle this usage of the word narcissism from our colloquial one, where we say that someone who's self-involved and egotistical is narcissistic? First of all, we make a distinction, clinical distinction, between narcissistic disorders, for example, narcissistic personality disorder, which is extreme, an extreme form of mental illness, and narcissistic style. Narcissistic style is narcissism light. 
It simply means that you behave in a way that is reminiscent of a narcissist, but you don't have the psychological background, the motivations, the dynamics that are typical of a narcissist. You just behave in ways that remind people of narcissism. So, narcissism, there are three types of narcissism. There is the clinical entity, the, cl the pathology, the sickness. That's one thing. And they should be diagnosed only by a qualified diagnostician. You can't fling this word about and attribute narcissism mm. to people. I mean, they need to be diagnosed. Only 1% of the population have narcissistic personality disorder. Another 5 to 6% have narcissism. And that's global or is that a US-based statistic? No, it's a global statistic. Another 5 to 6% have narcissistic style. Just a moment. To linger on that 1%, that's, that's interesting to me. Because earlier, it seemed like narcissists or people who have narcissistic personality disorder were made from trauma. And to me, it would seem like that's extremely social. So the trauma in Japan would be of a different sort or less or more than the trauma of Canada. But you're saying, no, no, no. It occurs approximately 1% yeah, it occurs, it, it, globally. The prevalence is identical in, in the 40 or 50 societies we have studied. So maybe we would find different if we were to study another 100. But I think 40 to 50 is a representative sample. And that includes Japan and Afri countries in Africa and Egypt and Israel and, and so on. Interesting. Um, the reason is that narcissism is a reaction to trauma regardless of the nature of the trauma. And it is channeled via social mores and conventions and so on. Let me explain what I just said. If you're a, a Japanese kid and you're exposed to trauma, you are likely to develop narcissistic defenses. As one option, there are other options. You could become codependent. You could develop borderline. I mean, there are other options. But one of the options is that you become a narcissist. So you're likely to develop uh, narcissistic defenses. However, the way these defenses manifest would be socially preordained. Society will dictate to you how to express your narcissism. So in Japan, for example, we have collective narcissism. The Japanese narcissist would brag about belonging, belonging to Toyota, belonging to a club, belonging to a social, socioeconomic stratum. So the, the Japanese narcissist expresses his narcissism, his grandiosity via his affiliation, via his, via belonging to a, to a collective or a social group. While in the United States, which is highly individualistic, the narcissist would emphasize his own accomplishments, his own standing and status and relative positioning and possessions and wealth and um, mate or intimate partner or, and so on. So it, it's still narcissism, regardless of how it's expressed. And it's important to understand that narcissism is multifarious, is has many guises and disguises, and, and it's wrong to say that all narcissists behave the same, they all have the same constitution, composure, and, and um, comportment, and so on. No, it's not true. It's highly... Interesting. It's highly culture-bound. It is so culture-bound, in other words, it so depends on culture and society, that they are very serious scholars that contest the clinical meaningfulness of narcissistic personality disorder. They say it's not a mental illness. It's a form of social dysfunction or social problem or it's not a mental illness. Definitely, antisocial personality disorder, also known as psychopathy, strikes me at least, and many other scholars, as totally not a mental illness. It's not a mental illness. It, it's, compri it's comprised of behaviors that society find, finds detestable, unacceptable, objectionable, obnoxious. So, that's society's problem. We are medicalizing and we are pathologizing many, too many things, way too many things. The DSM started off <clears throat> with 100 pages in 1952. Today, 60 years later or 70 years later, there's a thousand pages. Thousand, tenfold. Have we become 10 times more crazy? Or maybe we are over pathologizing and over medicalizing behaviors which shouldn't be. Maybe narcissism is nothing but being an a hole. 
and a jerk. I happen to think so. Of course, all behaviors are determined by internal dynamics, uh, specific constellations, certain constructs that operate or don't operate, and so on and so forth. It's, you can't say just because the narcissist has a special uh, constellation or complexion or combination of constructs and psychological processes and dynamics, that means he's mentally ill. You can't say that. So I had interjected when you were describing the differences between the three types of narcissists. You did? <laughs> I yes. already forgot. Can you please continue? So we were just on narcissist, narcissistic personality disorder, and then you were saying there were two other kinds. Yeah. Okay. So that's a clinical thing. Then the second layer or second type of narcissism, if you wish, is the narcissism of ostentation. It's the need to be seen, the need to be noticed. Uh, the need to be seen is primordial. It's a survival strategy. Babies who are not seen are dead babies. They die. You need to attract attention from day one. The minute you're born, you need to attract attention. You start to smile. You start to smile. You start to cry. These are all behavioral cues intended to manipulate the adults around you to keep you safe and give you food and keep you warm and dry as a baby. Two-day-old two day, two day baby, one-week-old baby. So the need to be seen is embedded, it's biological. And the population nowadays has exploded. So now we are, we are coping with 8.2 billion people. It's very difficult to be seen. It's very difficult to be noticed. We used to live in villages where everyone knew everyone and everyone made everyone's business their own, their own business. Right. So everyone was getting a lot of attention. A lot. Sometimes this attention was annoying, a nuisance, intrusive. Yeah, I agree. But you got attention all the time. So now we live in anonymous um, warehouses known as cities. And these cities are also virtual environments because they are not linked to any manufacturing, anything tangible, and they're not linked to the soil or to nature. This is a virtual environment which is functions as a warehouse, human warehouse. And it's difficult to garner attention. It's difficult to be seen and to be noticed. And this gives rise to narcissistic behaviors, which are not necessarily clinically pathological, but they are highly narcissistic, all the same. Attention-seeking, um, addiction to narcissistic supply, um, escalation of behavior, very similar. Addiction to narcissistic supply? Yeah, narcissistic supply is a, a general term for attention, adulation, admiration, affirmation, being feared, being noticed, and so on. It's addictive. So you need to escalate your behavior all the time in order to obtain the same impact or outcome. Understood. And this is the second layer of narcissism. And it's much more common, of course, in the clinical manifestation. And there's a third layer of narcissism, and that is a societal cultural layer. Narcissism is hard-baked, built into many of the tenets and the percepts of civilization, modern civilization, postmodern civilization. It started with Protestantism, which is a highly narcissistic version of Christianity. And it progressed from there, and it merged and coalesced with narcissistic elements in other religions, other ideologies, other creeds, and so on and so forth. And today we have a narcissistic civilization. And yes, it's a universal civilization. Of course, China is totally indistinguishable from the United States in every way that matters. So, and so, that, so is Japan, and so is Israel, and so is Egypt. Wherever I go, I feel at home. I feel at home because it's a universal civilization, you know? And so this civilization is highly narcissistic. It rewards narcissism. It incentivizes narcissism. In July 2016, the magazine New Scientist came up with a cover story. Parents make uh, help your children be narcissists. <laughs> so simple as that. It's, an adapt it's a positive adaptation. It's an adaptive strategy. If you are a narcissist, you end up in the White House. If you're a narcissist, you end up being the richest man on earth. If you're a narcissist, you end up being an influencer. Narcissism pays. 
narcissism is a is a coping strategy but also enhances self-efficacy the ability to extract favorable outcomes from changing environments so people adopt narcissism as a shortcut to success and they're right to do so they're absolutely right to do so and so you have a confluence of these three types of narcissism the clinical the behavior the ostentatious behavioral one and the societal cultural um efficacious one this creates what i what i would call a narcissistic sphere or narcissistic bubble you have no incentive to exit narcissism imagine that donald trump comes to me as a patient and i tell him you know donald you're highly narcissistic it's really horrible we need to treat it we need to because <laughs> why why do we need to treat it i'm having gorgeous girls i'm having billion i'm i'm a multi billionaire and i'm the ex and future president of the united states give me one good reason to not be a narcissist you know what would you say to that you're right it's a positive adaptation you see the the mistake in in psychology in definitely in psychotherapy is to impose your values <clears throat> to impose values i call it axiological practice when you impose values you you're getting it wrong when you start to use words like good and bad evil uh, wrong you're getting things wrong you're getting things wrong absolutely the only two questions when someone comes to you or when you come across someone is are is this person functional and is this person egocentric in other words content i wouldn't say happy but content okay with himself feels comfortable with it egocentric egocentric means you feel comfortable with yourself so regardless of your diagnosis and your anything else if you are fully functional in all fields of life and if you're happy with who you are why would i interfere why would i intervene even if you diagnose with a psychotic disorder why would i intervene it's illegitimate to intervene by imposing my values then you know narcissism is bad i don't care that you're happy i don't care that you're functioning you're a narcissist and i should cure you <laughs> that's wrong it's absolutely wrong it also denies the autonomy personal autonomy of the other it's dictatorial it's authoritarian it's not okay and large part of psycho psychology and psychiatry is being abused for social control and not only in dictatorships we use or abuse psychology and psychiatry to impose specific uh, specific uh, social eth ethos specific values specific conventions and norms specific behavioral scripts we recruit psychology and psychiatry and psychotherapy um to exert an influence which is illegitimate and you wrong it's wrong to do this it compromises the alleged alleged scientific nature of psychology and psychiatry they are not sciences they are pseudo sciences but still they have a claim to science so it compromises it and it causes people to lose trust in the profession because when you dictate to people how they should be it means you you are assuming a grandiose super position of supremacy i will tell you what is healthy i will tell you how you should be i will tell you whether the way you are now is okay or not because i have the absolute god given yardstick and benchmark as to how you should be and i'm going to shape and mold you shrink you know these these uh, these words and these phrases indicate the fear the fear of this imposition you say a, a head shrink no it's not a, not a positive view of psychiatry mm -hmm. is some of this not already taken care of at least in cluster a and cluster c as far as i know that if you look up any of those disorders and they'll say okay here's an outline here's a checklist for them and then number 9 would be does this interfere with your work life and personal life and if it doesn't that's a major marker against you having a disorder that's the way it should have been that's the way it should have been but it's not the way it is this is known as the polythetic problem you have nine criteria in 
for example, Gnosticism, the DSM-4, the fourth edition, and it has been carried, carried over to the fifth edition, shockingly, because it's like 25 years old, and it reflects knowledge that is long ago debunked. But okay. To diagnose the narcissists, um, I, would, I would need to identify five out of nine diagnostic criteria, according to the DSM-4 and 5. If that is if I'm not using the alternative model of the, of the DSM-5, which was relegated to the appendix. <laughs> okay. If, I, if, I, if you qualify, if you meet five of the diagnostic criteria, you're diagnosed. And that has nothing to do with whether you're functioning or not functioning well, how you feel about yourself, and even has nothing to do with whether your behavior conforms to your particular idiosyncratic culture and society. Because some cultures and societies encourage behaviors that other cultures and societies pathologize. And we need to be culturally right, right. We need to be culturally sensitive. That is absent in the DSM. Because the DSM is a, is a list. And if you satisfy a portion of that list, you're diagnosed. End of story. Nothing you can do about it. You can't protest. You can't say, yes, I meet eight of the nine diagnostic criteria, but in my country, this is normal behavior. You can't say this. I meet nine out of the nine diagnostic criteria, but I'm very happy with who I am. And my functioning is perfect. I'm president of the United States. I'm multi-billionaire and I bed every beautiful woman around. I'm perfectly happy. You can't say this. You just can't say this. These are not acceptable arguments. If you, hmm. if you meet the diagnostic criteria, which is wrong. So what would be those criteria so that someone I know that you mentioned that you shouldn't self-diagnose. You need to be clinically diagnosed. They include, uh, for example, lack of empathy, exploitativeness, envy, and so on and so forth. They're widely available only. Currently on screen is the DSM criteria, and you can pause it. In the DSM-5, in the appendix, in the text revision which was published two years ago as well, there is something called alternative model. Alternative model uh, uh, sounds a lot like a text lifted from uh, Dostoevsky. <laughs> It's literature. Hmm. It's written like literature. It's beautiful. And it describes the life and the internal processes of the narcissist. And I'm kidding you not. It reads like Dostoevsky. So I would much rather adhere to the alternative text than to the DSM's list, bullet list of nine diagnostic criteria, because I think the alternative model captures the essence of narcissism, not the behaviors, not the, not the way other people react to the narcissist, not the way the narcissist feels about other people. It captures what and who, what it is to be a narcissist and who is a narcissist. That's the alternative model, not the diagnostic criteria. Let's say that a woman is in a relationship with a man and it's all splendid. She loves him and he loves her. At least that's what she perceives. But something's off and she can't put her finger on it. She suspects he may be a narcissistic abuser. This has happened to her in the past. What would be some checklist that this woman can use as a heuristic? And then I would like to ask you the same question, but from the male perspective. Let's start with the fact that um, today, nowadays, half of all people diagnosed with narcissistic personalities so are women. That did not used to be the case 40 years ago when about 75% of people diagnosed with NPD were men. So the gender bias, either the gender bias is disappearing, I hate your earphones. <laughs> Sorry about no, that. No, don't worry. Either the gender bias is disappearing or women are becoming more narcissistic. I believe it's the latter because women are also becoming more masculine. According to studies by Lisa Wade and many others, women describe themselves now in strictly, exclusively masculine terms. In 1980, eight out of nine adjectives that women used to describe themselves were identified as feminine. And today, eight out of nine adjectives that women use to describe themselves are definitely masculine. For example, competitive, ambitious, ruthless, and so on. So women have become more male 
like, more masculine. And since narcissism has always been a men's problem, a men's mental illness, so it seems that masculine women are, are becoming more narcissistic. Now, the, the first thing to understand is that your gut instinct and intuition are frequently wrong when it comes to the to circumstances and the external world and objects and and even decision making and so on. They are about they are wrong about half the time. Your intuition and gut instinct, but your intuition and gut instinct are rarely wrong when it comes to other people. We perceive other people correctly. We often perceive situations hmm. and uh, decision trees and wrongly, but we perceive other people very correctly. So the first tip is, if something feels wrong, off key, not put together, well, not well put together, something doesn't fit, walk away. You are likely right. This, by the way, has a name. It's called the Uncanny Valley Reaction. In 1970, there was a Japanese roboticist. His name was Masahiro Mori, of course. And he, he came up with, the, he, he conducted a series of studies and he discovered that people react with growing discomfort. They become more ill at ease the more a robot resembles a human being. Exactly the opposite of what we, what we would intuitively think. It's counterintuitive. The more the robot resembles a human, the more uncomfortable we feel in the presence of the robot. And this is known as uncanny valley. When you're in the presence of a narcissist, a narcissist is an unfinished human. Some, uh, a work in progress. <laughs> that would never progress. Narcissists lack critical elements that comprise, comprise human beings. Narcissists lack empathy. They have no access to positive emotions. They lack a functioning ego. They don't have a constellated self, etc., etc. In many respects, narcissists are therefore a kind of artificial intelligence, a kind of robot. But externally, they look like human beings. It's like a very good simulation of a human being, but it's not a human being. So you would have an uncanny valley reaction in the presence of a narcissist. A voice in your head or in your gut or wherever it is would tell you, this thing looks like you, a human being, but it's not full-fledged. It's half-baked. Something is wrong. It's not fully put together or rightly put together. I mean, something's wrong there. You should obey this uncanny valley reaction. Second tip, do not pay any attention to the way the narcissist behaves with you because the narcissist is trying to manipulate you, trying to charm you, uh -huh. trying to charm you, trying to obtain outcomes. He's goal-oriented, like psychopaths, are also goal-oriented. Pay attention to how the narcissist treats other people, not you. How does he treat the waitress? Right. How does it treat the cab driver? How does it treat, um, I don't know, the concierge? Pay attention. How does it treat his mother? Pay attention to how the narcissist interacts with other people. Because with you, it's an act. It's a show. It's a theater production. You can't trust it. You're not obtaining any reliable information from his interaction with you. That's the second tip. Third tip. Alacrity. Speed. The narcissist would offer you marriage on a second date, usually, if he's very slow. And he would suggest to have, <laughs> he would suggest to have four children with you on the third date. And he would ask you to move into his place or he would move into your place on the fifth date. That's too fast. The speed is alarming, indicative of something that is wrong. He is not interacting with you. Is interacting with some figment in his fantasy and imagination. And because he's already intimate with his mind, this intimacy, ersatz, instant intimacy, carries over to you. So it's a legitimate request from the narcissist to the partner to say, hey, would you, would you like to be married? I want to do this. It's a legitimate request on, on, <laughs> after two years. It's not feigning something in order to be manipulated. Oh, you mean if and, the, he means it? Yeah, he means it. 
It means it. That's why when you when you go online, where 90, and uh, again, I'm being charitable, 90% of the information is wrong. Uh, they say narcissists gaslight, narcissists lie. No, narcissists are delusional. They fully believe everything they're telling you. That's the problem. The problem is they deceive you because they're authentic. They're real. They mean it. This is a point of contention with people who dislike Trump. They'll say, versus the Trump supporters, the dislikers will say he's lying, and the Trump supporters would say, I sense authenticity and honesty from them. So do, so do I. I think he's authentic in his insanity, in his delusionality, in his cruelty. Everything is authentic. The narcissist truly believes his stories, his promises, his intentions, the fantasies he imposes on you or introduces you into. The future, as he delineates it, he doesn't future fake. Narcissists don't future fake. They fully believe the future that they're selling you on. So this is important to understand. This is a confusion between narcissists and psychopaths. Psychopaths manipulate you knowingly. This is known as Machiavellianism. Psychopaths, um, if they make a promise, they know they're going to break it. If they make an offer, it's goal-oriented. They know the difference between fantasy and reality. They're selling the fantasy to you. They remain stuck in reality, the psychopaths. They are firmly embedded and grounded in reality, but they want you to lose your mind. They gaslight you. They falsify your reality. They induce, induct you into fantasy, and they do it intentionally in a premeditated manner. It's part of a plan. The narcissist is not like that. Narcissists are highly automatic. Most of the processes are unconscious. And they believe. Everything that they say, they believe because they're grandiose. Everything they say is the word of God. How could you, how could you distrust or doubt it? No way. It's a God speaking, you know? So, um, that's the second sign, the alacrity, the speed. The third sign, I'm sorry, the speed. The fourth sign is control. Narcissists have severe separation insecurity, which colloquially is known as abandonment anxiety. Exactly like borderlines. But while a borderline clings like a codependent, a borderline would cling to you and would emotionally blackmail you in order to make sure that you don't abandon her and don't reject her. And she would become hysterical and emotionally dysregulated if there's even a hint or a whiff of abandonment and rejection. The narcissist try, <clears throat> tries to control you. The narcissist's solution to the conundrum of abandonment is to control you. So the narcissist, from the get-go, from the first date, would be in control. He would take the keys from your hand and lock your door. He would, he would drive you to a restaurant of his choosing. He would order food and drinks for you without asking you. He would then interrogate you why it took you so long to be in the bathroom. And so on. He's in control. You feel like an employee with a very strict boss. And that's from the first minute. And finally, I mean, there are many more tips, but I'm giving five. Sure. Finally, fantasy. S incongruence. There, there are huge discrepancies in the autobiographical data provided by the narcissist, and usually in the first few, few meetings or occasions, the narcissist would focus on you exclusively. It's like a laser focus, and you become the, the total center of attention. You're idealized, and it's irresistible. You fall for yes, it. Yes, it sounds attractive. It's attractive. You fall for it. It's intoxicating. And you want more and more. And only the narcissist can give it to you. And so this way he gets you addicted. But if he does provide, and when he does provide, autobiographical material, it's, it's usually contradictory. Usually there are severe discrepancies. And usually it co they contain, the, the personal history of a narcissist contains a lot of evident Fantasy. Evident. Examples. 
a narcissist can tell you that um, his work is uh, groundbreaking and he is about to win the Nobel Prize. I'm kidding you not. Sounds stupid, isn't it? <laughs> but then the contradiction would be, he may say this, but then... It's clear that uh, it's fantasy. He fantasizes. Oh, 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 sorry. What I meant to say was, can you please provide an example of something from their past that they would say at one instant and then they would contradict well, on, it later? Well, on, on a first date, on a first date, the Nazis would tell you that he was a member of the special forces or the SAS or depending on the country. And then on a second date, he would tell you that he never served in the army. Okay, that's interesting, but I don't see how they believe that then. At any given moment, at any given moment, they believe it. That's, that's the thing that's difficult. It's difficult to wrap your mind around this. They are not committed to any single version of reality. They're committed to the contemporary fantasy. And the contemporary fantasy could last six months. It could last six hours. It could definitely last six minutes. And, but at any given moment, they're committed. One of the reasons, now that you ask why, one of the reasons is dissociation. Dissociation is a set of defenses, a group of defenses. The most famous of which is amnesia, forgetting things. But there are other types of dissociative defenses, which I will not go into because they're more typical of borderline. Derealization, depersonalization, and so on. The narcissist dissociates a lot. In other words, the narcissist has memory gaps. These memory gaps are substantial, not small. I'll give you a personal example. And, and these memory gaps pertain only to autobiographical personal history, not, not to other types of memory that involve executive memory, episodic memory, and so on. No, no, not, for example, uh, to professional knowledge or to recognizing people that could be of use to you. I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about your own life story. Once I made an exercise, I sat down and I wrote every single thing I remembered from my eight, eight years first marriage. I was married for eight years to the same woman. It was a tumultuous period. I was at the time very rich and very famous and in my, my country and so on. So you can imagine we traveled a lot. There were many things and so on. Many things to remember. It wasn't like a humdrum pedestrian existence that it's difficult to forget. Okay, so I, I made a list a very exhaustive list of every single thing I remembered from my marriage. And then I assigned a time value to each of the memories. So for example, I remember having lunch. That would be one and a half hours. Okay. It's like a time. Uh, value. I see. Okay. okay. Duration. A duration. When I summed up the durations, what I got was about one day, about 24 hours. That's all I remember from eight years of marriage. And I think I've been over generous. I think it's closer to 10 hours. That's all I remember. So narcissists have tremendous dissociation, enormous. They needed to dissociate as children in order not to confront the full wrath and brunt of the abuse and the trauma and so on. Of course, a dissociation is a classic reaction to trauma, also in borderline, actually in borderline, Dissociation is a diagnostic criterion. But Kernberg already said that borderline and narcissism are the same thing. So, okay. How does a narcissist compensate for these memory gaps? He invents stories. He says, I see. He says, let me think what could have happened. What's the most plausible thing to have happened? What probably had happened? And this occurs at an unconscious level, so it's a confabulation. It's largely, it's a confabulation. It's largely unconscious. And then the narcissist believes it and is committed to it and would defend it to the death if you were to challenge it or undermine it or provide evidence to the contrary. He would dispute the veracity and objectivity and the very existence of the evidence. And I'm talking about tape recordings, video recordings, nothing. No way to shake the confabulation. No way to undermine it to challenge it, period. That's reality as far as he's concerned. So if a narcissist finds himself earlier in the morning sleeping in his bed and then at four o'clock in the afternoon in the country club and he can't remember what had happened between point A and point B, 
he would fabricate, he would confabulate the intervening period. He would say, probably I went to work. And at work, probably I met, met my, my boss. And then probably he gave me a project. And I was so immersed in the project that I forgot everything about it, about, uh, about the environment. And, so, and he would invent all this. And then the next day he would ask him, what did you do yesterday? Oh, I woke up in the morning. My boss gave me a project. I worked all day on the project. And I, I, I needed to relax. And I went to the country club. It sounds like being in a relationship with someone who has NPD would, this is where the term gaslighting comes from, because they would make you feel as if you've lost your mind because you found camera evidence that suggests otherwise, but they're so confident with saying otherwise, sure. with contradicting what you already consider to be reality, that you tend to actually lose your mind. Yes, only it's not gaslighting. It's, uh, in the case of narcissism, it's confabulation. Gaslighting involves premeditation, intentional misleading regarding reality. So providing you with misleading information regarding reality, which would cast your own judgment of reality, your own... Uh, and, uh, your own. I see, I see. So that's the subtle distinction yes, is that most yes. people believe that the narcissist is doing it purposefully. No, never. It's, there's effort. Yeah. There's, it's effortful. No. No. I see. Psychopaths do. Psychopaths do, narcissists don't. The famous movie, the famous two movies, Gaslight, they involve a psychopath, not a, not a narcissist. The man there is a psychopath. It seems far easier to emulate a psychopath than a narcissist. Yes, and that's why... For people who aren't narcissists. And that's why I say that psychopaths are normal. <laughs> a, psychopath, uh -huh. a psychopath is an exaggerated person. Okay? You have goals, a psychopath has goals. You're sometimes defined. A psychopath is always defined. I see. So it's a spectrum and they're extreme. Yeah, they're like an extreme human being, an exaggerated human being, uh, kind of a caricatured human being. But they're human. They're identifiably human. Psychopaths. They have a self, they have, uh, they recognize people as external, they have intact reality testing. They are, they don't pay by the, play by the social rules. End of story. Not nice. Many of them should end up in prison. Many of them do. But there's nothing to do with mental illness. <laughs> the narcissist is an entirely different ballgame. He can't help it. These dynamics are unconscious. It's doubtful whether he has and unconscious even. I mean, some scholars doubt it, like Lacan mm. and, and myself. It's a seriously disrupted, it's like, you know, the girl interrupted. It's like human interrupted. It's a seriously disrupted person who was in the making. Raw material. It's raw material. It's protoplasm. It's not a psychopath. The psychopath is full-fledged. <laughs> maybe the psychopath is too full-fledged. It's a kind of Malignant individualism, you know, psychopathy, malignant individualism, uh, which doesn't recognize the constraints of society and any, any refuses to obey any expectations and so on. But the narcissist can't, even if he want to, he wants to, he just can't do it. He doesn't have the tools. He doesn't have the, nothing is helping. Narcissists. So what hope is there then for the narcissist? None, None and don't buy into all kinds of self-styled experts or self-enriching experts. I regard this as an extreme form of charlatanism and uh, not to say con artistry, to claim that NPD can be healed. I've seen this online. What about coped with? What about coped with? You can definitely modify certain abrasive and antisocial behaviors of the narcissist using modalities like uh, schema therapy, even transactional analysis, some forms of CBT. Yeah, there are some modalities that allow you to somehow reach into the narcissist or to the narcissist and somehow convince the narcissist to modify behaviors in the short term, by the way. There's always a relapse. It's like eternal maintenance. You have to do it again and again. Recurrence. Yeah. So, but behavior modification is where it stops. There's nothing else that can be done with or to the narcissist. None. Nothing. That's not some Wagner only. That's Theodore Millen, that's Kernberg, that's big names. <laughs> we all think that... It does seem like there's hope. The hope is to do something on a daily or weekly basis. So, for instance, we shower. 
hopefully on a semi-daily basis. And we don't think, oh, I'm not cured of my uncleanliness. Shoot, I need to shower again. So in the same way, can not a narcissist just view what they have if they're self-aware enough and then also wanting to change? You're talking, you're talking now from society's point of view. Yes, you can reduce, as I said, abrasive and antisocial behaviors of narcissism and render narcissism innocuous. So that narcissism no longer, the narcissist no longer adversely impacts people around him or her. But what about the narcissist? What about the internal experience of the narcissist? What about the depress depressive cycles the narcissist is going through? What about the pain and the suffering and the, this is what cannot be tackled, touched, healed, nothing. This is the hopeless part. Yes, of course you can modify. It's like a clockwork orange. You know the movie, yeah? Mm -hmm. I don't mean society to modify the narcissist. I'm saying if there's someone who's watching who has NPD and they think, man, I don't like my lifestyle. I have these depressive episodes, like you mentioned. There are negative effects to me. You I'm can not modify, modify behaviors, but behaviors are only external. It's like domesticating a dog or taming a lion. You can modify behaviors, of course. But you can have no, you cannot touch the inside of the narcissist because there's nothing there. There's nothing to do internally. If you condition someone to mimic, essentially, <laughs> certain behaviors, yes, it makes a narcissist's life easier also. If he's less antisocial, less abrasive, less obnoxious, less, of course, life becomes more pleasant to him and to others. I agree. But this is society's point of view. I see. They would still feel empty. Yes, they would still feel empty and depressed and broken and suffering. Or they would feel um, sh ashamed. The narcissist's biggest horror is to get in touch with his reservoir of shame. Um, they would still be mocked and ridiculed on multiple occasions because of their grandiosity and so on and so forth. And they would spot it, a process known as mortification. Mortification. Yes. They would still sometimes become emotionally dysregulated and suicidal. If, for example, they've been shamed in public. So they are still broken. They're still broken. In BPD, in borderline personality disorder, we have a better prognosis. But again, it's more or less the same. In BPD, we have a, a very efficacious treatment modality. It's called dialectical behavior therapy, DBT. And DBT reverse. Uh, um, Heals, you could say heals borderlines because they lose, the, yeah. they lose the diagnosis. They can no longer be diagnosed with borderline in 50% of the cases. If you were to wait until you were, you're 45, 81% of people with borderline personality diso it, uh, disorder lose the diagnosis. So the prognosis is excellent, you know? And yet, <clears throat> multiple studies have demonstrated that many of the internal dynamics are there. A feeling of brokenness, of emptiness, of that's still there. I see. You know, medicine, classical medicine has been going on for at the very least 5,000 years. Maybe if we run another interview, you and me, 5,000 years from now, I'd be a lot more optimistic. Right, right. So prior to dialectical behavioral therapy being invented, there was no hope or almost no hope for the person with more or less. borderline personality more or less disorder. And it's, now there's some hope. And it's been invented. By so a, we don't know, who knows, 100 years from now, 50 years, 10 years. There's also experience. Listen, 5,000 years, you know, we know a lot about the brain, the skull, you know, experience. Yes. We, uh, psychology started, if I'm very, if I'm very generous, started 150 years ago. It's young. Yes. It's young, not Jung. Like it, it didn't start with Carl Jung. You mean literally young. It's, okay, it's Jung, it. yeah. In German, it's Jung. <laughs> okay. Now, from the man's perspective, a man is going out with a woman, okay? Is it the same, same. five signs? Same. It's a myth that uh, male narcissists and female narcissists are not the same. They're absolutely the same. Uh, the, the female narcissist is likely to be a bit more histrionic. So she would be, uh, she would, there would be displays of hyper-emotionality, which are essentially fake. And so she would pose as hyper-emotional, uh, she would be seductive and flirtatious. Toward you or toward other people in front of you? You're talking about the date. Ah, you mean, uh, you know, with everyone, with everyone. I see. 
and uh, she would emphasize external appearances, her looks, her clothing, her makeup. Her... But that's a throwback to the patriarchy. <laughs> it's a throwback to... Otherwise, there's no psychological difference between men and women nowadays. Maybe 40, 50 years ago, yes. But nowadays, no. And for the people who scrubbed forward to this part of the interview, can you please quickly recapitulate the five factors that you outlined earlier? The five tips, you mean? So those five factors, the first one being that you want to observe how they treat other people, not just exclusively yourself. And then the second one slips my mind. The third one, celerity. Fourth, domineering. Fifth has to do with contravening information about their past. Yeah, so I said, uh, uh, if he moves too fast, it, first of all, if you, feel, if you feel uncomfortable, trust your feeling, walk away. If he moves too fast, but I mean, dramatically too fast, insanely too fast, walk away. If he misbehaves with other people, if he abuses other people, humiliates them, insults them, and so on and so forth, but is very nice to you and very kind with you, walk away, means he's acting. And if he's do uh, domineering, is immediately in control, um, walk away. Basically, these are the, the things. And all these things happen on the first date. Oh, and contradictory autobiographical information. Contradictory, yes. All these things happen on a first date. It's a lie to say that he, he put on a mask. He was a wonderful actor. I didn't know any of this until, you know, two years later. It's nonsense. All of this happens on the first date. You just have to pay attention. And you have to, uh, you have to prioritize your well-being over other needs. Many, many people, they're so lonely, they overlook things. They say, okay, maybe he's obnoxious, but he is, I don't know, kind to me. Don't, re don't deny, don't repress. It's don't, uh, don't sacrifice your future well-being just in order to be with someone because you're lonely right now. Um, the narcissist announces his or her narcissism loudly, ostentatiously, visibly, conspicuously, on the first date, on the first minute. And above all, your body keeps the score. You feel queasy. You feel, you feel drowsy. You feel something's wrong when you're with a narcissist. And that happens in the first 10 seconds. Now, if you were abused as well as a child or, or teenager or whenever, does that dull your body's, earlier we referenced, you sense something's off, your gut instinct. Does that dull it and it leads victims to repeat a harmful pattern? It actually sensitizes you to it. In other words, if you, if you grow up in a dysfunctional, abusive family and so on, you are likely to immediately identify an abuser or, and react. Oh, it sensitizes you to it. I see. Yes. Not desensitize, sensitize. You are, you are likely to, to react very powerfully to the presence of an abuser, but you may find the abuser attractive because that's your comfort zone. That's what you're used to. That's where you, that was your, that's where you grew up in. That was your upbringing. That's, you were conditioned to love abusers. You've learned as a child to associate love with pain, love with abuse. So you're far more likely to identify an abuser, but you're also more likely to be attracted to an abuser because it's like recreating your childhood recreating the comfort zone, you know the ropes, you know the behaviors, you know how to manipulate, you believe, you know how to manipulate the abuser, and everything feels safe. It's a, what we call a secure base. I see. Professor, can you please tell me your thoughts on the mind-body problem? I, uh, I think in... Most philosophical inquiries, the problem is always language rather than essence. The minute you say mind-body problem, you make certain assumptions about reality. For example, you make assumptions about the separation between mind and body. You make assumptions about possible interactions between mind and body. Uh, you make assumptions about uh, observer and observed. Descartian assumptions. And so I don't think, I think that the question is phrased wrongly, not your question, the question is phrased uh, wrongly. I don't think the question should be about 
mind and body, I think the question should be about external and internal. Um, everything that we are is internal, our body included. We create a model of the world, which by the way in psychology is known as internal working model. We create a model of the world where we are the inner sanctum. We are, we are the internal and all the rest is external. This raises very important questions about the concepts of background and the concepts of context and the concept of information. And the minute you phrase the question in these terms, there is no need anymore to make distinction between mind and, and body. Uh, the experience of the internal cannot be divorced this way. For example, take trauma. Trauma has a pronounced bodily dimension, but obviously trauma has a pronounced mind dimension. Can you truly tell the difference? I don't think so. I think if you were to define yourself as the internal, then the whole problem collapses. I don't think the problem is the body-mind issue. I think the problem is experiencing yourself, the, the experience of self, uh, which partly is comprised of introspection, proprioception, and so on. The experience of the self. We self-report. We say, I experience myself this way. And that gives the impression that someone is providing the report. Who is reporting? You know? But if you divide the world into internal and external, the reporting is an act of externality. It has nothing to do with the internal. When you report, you report to me. I'm always external to you. You could report to yourself, of course, but that would be within the internal. It would not exit the internal. And therefore it would be meaningless in as far as the question of body-mind. If we reframe the question in terms of internal and external, we get rid of the dilemma and the conundrum completely. Because any attempt to communicate the internal to the external by definition, is exclusively external. And so, <laughs> your experience of yourself is exclusively internal and has no external bearing or meaning. It's meaningless. Your experience of yourself is meaningless. For example, can you truly communicate to me who you are and how you feel? Of course not. Ever, ever. That's known in, in philosophy as the intersubjectivity problem. Yeah. And so if we accept that there is an internal realm and an external realm, and that acts of introspection uh, are essentially external, not internal, because introspection is meaningless without self-reporting, then, the, then no problem arises. The problem arises the minute you say, both mind and body are in the world. They are both external. And now how, we ca how can we put them together? They're not. They don't have the same ontological status. That's what I'm trying to say. So does the problem of external versus internal have an analogy of self versus other? Yes. It's a particular case, a private case. It's not an equivalence though. No, it's a private case. Private case of... External versus internal. Sorry, disembroil for me, self versus other and internal versus external. Is one an example of the other? The other is external. The other is external. The self is internal. So it's a private case of external versus internal. But I can give you another case, for example. Science. Science is a case of internal versus external. Science is external, completely external. And you are, comp the scientist is completely internal. So, can we, therefore, make any meaningful statements about the scientist 
in a way which would somehow create a connection with the science? No. I, I do not think that internal and external are, for example, two facets of one reality. I don't think that they are bridgeable. I don't think that they are communicable. I don't think the science is a reflection of the internal state of the scientist. I don't think so. Even if the internal is, if they, even if a scientist reports his or her internal state and links it to the science, that would be a totally external act. We have no access to the internal ever in any way, shape, or form, not via language, not via philosophy, not via, no way, simply not. In this sense, my attitude is solipsistic. And of course, if you're a solipsist, the question of mind and body is, becomes meaningless because you are the only object. <laughs> and so everything is you. Every, it's like God. Would you ask about God if there is a mind pro body problem with God? No, because God is everything. God is being. And I think the big mistake we are all committing as philosophers, physicists, psychologists, I mean, all of them, is this constant eternal confusion between internal and external. It's the belief, the erroneous belief, that we can somehow communicate internal states, that there is a language bridge which would allow us to convey unequivocal information about our internal landscape, about who we are, about what we think, about what we feel, about, and that's unmitigated nonsense. There is no such bridge. In principle, there can never be such bridge. And so why ask about mind and body? None of them, none of them is external. And the only meaningful questions about are about the external world because we cannot ask meaningful questions about the internal world. Are you saying that there is an internal world? We just can't speak about it with language? I don't know. I don't know if there is an internal world. I have to trust. I have to take your word for it. I have to take your word for it. I only know that if there is an internal world, it has no bearing on the external. In principle, can never impact the external, can never be interact with the external. Can ne it's meaningless in the external. It's nothing to do with the external world. And the only meaningful questions are about the external world. Because you can never talk, you can never speak meaningfully about the internal world. Any statement you make about the internal world is, in the best case, doubtful. It is not ontological bearing and status. It cannot, in principle, have an ontological bearing and status. It's like God, you know, it's more or less. It's like God. This sounds different than the way that I hear some solipsists speak, where they're speaking as if everything is internal. Yes. And you're saying solipsists everything is external. Solipsists make the mistake that they, uh, they endow an internal state with ontological status. I'm saying I don't know if there's an internal state. I only know one thing. If there is an internal state, we cannot discuss it in external terms. We can, it has no bearing on the external world. And because the only meaningful questions must somehow correspond to an external thing, somehow. You cannot ask a meaningful question that does not correspond to something external to the question. So. <laughs> This is interesting. This sounds anti-solipsistic. It's not anti-solipsistic. It's a solipsism that is um, skeptical. Skeptical solipsism, if you wish. Okay, if you want to combine the... Skeptical solipsism. The solipsist is like the atheist. The atheist says there's no God. I, I disagree with that. That is a religion. There is God and there is no God. These are... The, they have a ontological equivalency. These two sentences are equally, equal ontologically. There is God, there is no God. It's like a counterfactual, yes? But uh, if I say, I don't know if there is a God, that's a valid statement. It's a valid statement about what? About the external world. Not about the internal world of God, not about God's composition, not about God's mind, not about God. <laughs> when I say, I don't know if there's a God, it's an ontological statement about the external world. 
Similarly, I don't know if you have a mind. I don't know if anyone has a mind. I don't know anything about the internal world of anyone, ever. I think I have an internal world. I'm not quite sure of this either. Could be an artifact. I, I don't know. An artifact of? Artifact of my hardware, for example. There's no ability to discuss the internal world in any meaningful way. And since body, mind are internal, definitely the mind, there's no reason or way to discuss this question meaningfully. It's exactly as you asked me, do you think God exists? Why would I waste my time on this question? Similarly, why would I waste my time on the body-mind question? It has no bearing on the external world in principle. And this is, these are the only meaningful questions I'm willing to ask. I'm a scientist. I'm a physicist. I didn't ask you if God exists. No, I know. I'm comparing, I'm saying. Oh, you're saying like, if someone said. If someone asked me, if, does God okay. exist? I, I would give the same treatment. I would answer the same way. It's a meaningless question. It's a meaningless question. The mind-body problem is a meaningless question. What's Wittgenstein's private language argument? Wittgenstein argued that there is no possibility of a private language. And I beg powerfully to disagree. I mean, I just did it. I just disagreed. <laughs> I actually think the only uh, true languages, only pure languages, if you wish, echt in German, are, or, or real languages, are uh, private. I think what, I think public languages are desperate attempts to translate private languages to each other. I think we all have private languages and we are trying to translate them to each other using uh, codified statement strings, strings as codified statements that we call language. So, I believe that the only form of language is private language, is, uh, is the internal dialogue, is the, the feeling of one, perceiving oneself, feeling oneself, talking to oneself. And that's why I think concepts such in psychology, such as introjection, uh, are very powerful concepts because they imply the internalization of voices from the outside, mother's voice, father's voice, teacher's voice, never mind. Internalization of voices and appropriating them, making them your authentic voice. So, sort of coalescing. Everything coalesces. All these interests coalesce and become you. Lacan said, Lacan said that the unconscious, Jacques Lacan said the unconscious is the sum total of other people's speech. He made the unconscious totally relational. And I, I, I fully agree. I think we create a private language by appropriating speech, by appropriating uh, public language. And that is proof that the only true form of language is private. Because what do we do? We take public language and we convert it to private language. By the way, we do it all the time, even when you're an adult. Why do we need to translate from public to private if there is no private language or if private language is, is useless or meaningless? Because the only real language is private. And of course, uh, you know what? Forget Wittgenstein. Look at reality. <laughs> I always prefer reality to Wittgenstein. In reality, of course, everything is filtered. When I talk to you, it's filtered through your memories and through your upbringing and through your knowledge and through your circumstances and through the fact that I didn't let you sleep well and, you know, a million things. So this filtering converts my public speech into a private language. Introspection is totally private language. What did we say in the previous uh, question? That the internal and the external and the internal is managed via private language. Actually, I have a theory that I am working on. It's called internal intrapsychic activation model. 
And there's a, a video on my webs on my uh, channel, the YouTube channel. Yeah, that deals with I, IPAM, intrapsychic activation. And there, I deal with the with the issue of language, private languages, public languages, and so on and so forth, as a facilitator, and mediator, and and so on and so forth. So that's that's my view. I think the only language is actually private. I think we convert all public speech to private languages, and because these languages are private. There's no meaning. There's no, it's meaningless to talk about uh, the interface between internal and external. There's none. Even as far as language is concerned, there's none. The, you cannot discuss the internal. You cannot communicate the internal. It's, there's a firewall. It's not communicable. So the private language is meaningless? Private language is meaningless to others, absolutely. It's, it's not communicable. But at the same time, is the only pure form of language? Yes, because the only dialogue we ever manage is with ourselves. I can never understand what it is to be Kurt, to be you. I, you can never communicate it to me. Never mind how hard you try, and if you won six Nobel Prizes of lit in literature, you can never communicate it to me. You can hope to trigger me, to trigger in me reactions which you assume, God knows why, resemble your reactions. And this is called empathy. You can hope that I will empathize with you. And you could try to use language to make me empathize with you. You could say I'm sad. Or you can even use behavior. You can cry. And you could hope that I would empathize with you. But do you have access to my internal world? Of course not. Is this a bridge? No. Are you communicating? No. You're not. You're not because the reaction inside my head, in all probability, has nothing to do with the reaction inside your head. Communication means monovalence. What you send is what you get. You know? It's, it's, if communication is changed on the way, it's not communication. So when you broadcast to me, I'm sad, I'm crying, and so on, what you trigger in my brain, what you provoke in my brain, has nothing to do with what's going on in your mind. Nothing. Nothing. Because I have my own memories and my own fears and my own uh, recollections of crying and, and sadness. It's like to, nothing. Your, the way you love is not the way I love. The, the way you see red is not the way I see red. The color red. Even objective, you know, frequencies. It's not the thing. We cannot communicate our internal experience. Therefore, it has no bearing on the external world. And therefore, the only true language is a private language, not a public one. Because a public one falsifies the meaning. Public one is a failure. Public languages are failures. Why do you think there's so much conflict, so many wars, so many? Because public language is a gigantic failure. Because we pretend that a public language communicates internal states. It does not. And when we make this assumption, we end up fighting and killing each other. Because, you know, how could you not empathize with me? How don't you understand me? Uh, you're probably a bad person. You're pretending not to understand me. Or you're goal-oriented. You want something from me. It immediately provokes... Public language provokes paranoia. Provokes paranoid, persecutory ideation. Because it's such a failure. And so we, we try, we attempt desperately to come up with monovalent objective public languages. For example, mathematics. Mathematics is a language that is monovalent. Mathematician in Japan, in India, in Israel, and so on, will see the same thing, will think the same thing as any mathematician would tell you. It's rank nonsense. I'm mathematician also. <laughs> it's rank nonsense. Yes, you see the same equation, of course. But what it conjures in your mind, for example, the images, the visuals, completely different from one person to another. Otherwise, we would not have relativity theory. Completely different. There is no possibility for an objective, neutral, value neutral, memory neutral, uh, public language. And so the only language possible is private. Uh, do I know that you have a mind? No. Do I know that you have internal states? No. Do I know that you're using a private language? No. 
And so why discuss it? You understand what I'm saying? Not why discuss it with you. Why discuss it in philosophy? I think it's a no gigantic waste of time. So the private language is associated with the internal and the public is associated with external. Uh, yes, you, you could put it this way. Uh, it's again um, um, a case of, uh, of uh, external, a private case of external versus internal. The reason I say that is that earlier it sounded like you were saying all that we can meaningfully talk about is the external. And then it also sounds like you're saying that all that is pure is as a language is the internal to me, the pure. No, I didn't say all you can discuss is external. I said the only meaningful questions pertain to the external. I did not say that you can answer these questions, which would then constitute language and communication. I said the only meaningful questions you can pose would have to do with the external because it's because that is something that has ontological status and, and the questions can be communicated. Whether you can answer these questions, that's an entirely different uh, story. Wittgenstein suggested that private languages, the problem with private languages, sh if they were to ever exist, he, he claimed they did, don't exist, but if they were to exist, they said private languages would be incoherent. They would not produce consistent statements when, when confronted with the same circumstances and so on. And uh, there I, I, I actually agree with him. I think all languages, private and public, produce incoherent statements. Why? Because of Gödel. Kurt Gödel. Gödel suggested that you cannot have a system that is complete and consistent. You have to choose. If the system is complete, if it describes everything in your life, in your environment, in your life, and so it's likely to be inconsistent. In other words, incoherent in Wittgenstein's words, incoherent. And if it is coherent and consistent, it's likely to be limited, very limited. That's Kurt Gödel. So I think we can pose the right question, uh, pose questions, I'm sorry, about the external world, never about the internal world, not meaningful questions. But I think we will always fail in providing the answers. Hmm. That's why science is not about the truth. It's asymptotic to the truth. Science is the greatest failure in human history. Every scientific theory has failed. No exception, ex I mean, relativity. In due time, all scientific theory fail, fails. Fail. And you have also the problem known as incommensurability of theories, theories that succeed each other, don't have anything in common, and so on and so forth. So science is the record of human failures at attempting to use external communication or public language. That is science. And there we are using a language, mathematics, which is supposed to be neutral and objective and not suffer from human foibles and limitations. And yet we keep failing. Yet we keep failing all the time. We are doomed to fail when we try to communicate externally with a public language. We are doomed definitely to fail when we try to ascertain whether we use private languages because we have no access to anyone's mind. And so we are doomed to fail. The best we can hope for is to pose meaningful questions. It's the best we can hope for. Scientific endeavor is about posing the right questions, not about giving the right answers, because there are no right answers and never will be 2000 years from now. So for a scientist or a scientific theory to be proposed, it's usually done so as provisionally saying that, well, it's fallible. Something else is likely to replace it's a it. Criterion. Yeah. Criterion of falsifiability. And falsif if one is to say that it's asymptotic to the truth. How do you even declare that without presuming that there is some truth? And then even to say that it's false assumes that there is a truth for you to say you've missed the mark. How do you rectify that? The very fact that we can falsify predictions is a strong indicator that in theory, there could be a prediction that would never be falsified, which is what I call the truth.
That's my definition of the truth. If you could falsify predictions, means there could be a prediction you would not be able to falsify. And that we, at that point, we would call it the truth. However, what are the chances of this? Zero, of course. Just a moment, because string theory is by many accounts not falsifiable because they can always wiggle around and say that I agree. you've disproved a certain type of string theory. There are some edges to that, but let's just presume that's correct. Then would that mean by your account, string theory is true because it's unfalsifiable? No. They don't make predictions that in principle are falsifiable. You need to make a prediction that in principle could be falsifiable, but can never be falsified. Oh, you mean, sorry, sorry, just to be specific, you mean will never be falsified or can never be falsified? So you need to make a prediction that in principle can be falsified, but all the attempts to falsify it have failed. Even that, even that is, de is deductive, is, even that is dubious. But if you've been trying for, let's say, for discussion's sake, you've been trying for a million years to falsify a prediction and you fail for a million years, you cannot fault. Then you could say that the probability that this is the truth is very high, but you need to be able to falsify. The problem with string theories and other nonsense, such as many worlds theories, and, is that they are in principle not falsifiable. There's no way to test them, you understand? So, but of course you can imagine, and of course you know that if you can imagine something, it exists. You can imagine a theory in the future, okay, in the future, a theory, which would yield the prediction. And then immediately all of us would try to falsify it, and we would be working for one million years to falsify it and not succeeding. And we tried like 20,000 methods and 400 million techniques, and we fail. We cannot falsify it. Well, at some point you have to say, this must be the truth, you know. Of course, this will never happen, but it can happen. This is known as counter counterfactual philosophy. It's a counterfactual, but counterfactuals are very important in philosophy. So we can say that there is a truth. We can say there is a truth. It's statistical, it's deductive, or inducti induction, deduction problem, and so on and so forth. It's all true. I, I would agree with these criticisms. But there comes a point where practically you must stop. Like, what, million years? 10 million? Is okay? 50 million years? How much? Where would you stop and say, this must be the truth? No. The tricky part, though, and I know that we don't have much time, but the tricky part is even saying 1 million years, if one is to be this radical skeptic that would lead one to doubt the external or internal or what have you, why can't you be such a skeptic to even doubt the veracity of what probability means and also that a million years has occurred? First of all, I don't doubt the external. I doubt the internal. I don't doubt the internal either. I just, I'm saying I have no way to verify that it exists. I have no way to verify or to falsify. I cannot tackle the internal deductively or inductively. There's no, I can, uh, there's no way for me to interact with the internal, to approach it or to describe it or capture it with language. Simply it's, it's a supposition, it's a hypothesis, and that's it. The external, no, external, I am firmly grounded in reality, yes, I believe in the external. I mean, I, the external exists as far as I'm concerned. I, uh, a million years is an example. It's if you have been trying to do something for a million years and you have failed, that is what we call the truth. So for example, so the truth is probabilistic, of course. So, for example, the sun keeps rising. Now we have records of 10,000 years ago, which described the sun as rising. And we personally have had 60 years of, exp I had 60 years of experience with the sun rising. Uh, my mother had 90 years of experience. Her mother had, you know, etc. So at some point we say, you know what, for 10,000 years, the sun has been rising. It is true that the sun is rising. I agree with you that tomorrow, the sun may not rise. <laughs> Absolutely can happen. But how likely it is? Abs everything is probability. In the, in the foundations of reality, there is probability. When we discuss micronon theory, micronon theory makes probability even much more fundamental than quantum mechanics. Even much more fundamental than quantum mechanics. Because I don't believe 
there's any other way to tackle reality. I'm not saying that reality is probabilistic. I'm saying that we, the owing to our limitations, can tackle reality only probabilistically. All other ways are blocked. We, we have no access to all possible other ways. Yes. Now, God's point of view, if there were such an, an entity, maybe there is, maybe there isn't. I'm an agnostic, not an atheist. But if there were such an entity, God, not limited in time, not limited in space, all-encompassing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, maybe God doesn't need to use probability. Probably God doesn't need to use probability. But you know, uh, the Kabbalah is the mystical tradition in Judaism. The Kabbalah said that for God to create the world, he needed to minimize himself. This is called simtsum, the minimization. He minimized himself. And the cre act of creation was very traumatic. Many vessels were broken. And that the role of humanity is to heal God. Is God to translate, God suffered trauma in the act of creation. And our job is to heal God. The implications are mind-boggling. And it's, to me, shocking that someone in the 13th century uh, or 17th century could have said such things. Amazing. It's amazingly uh, daring, you know, to say such things. Some of the texts are from the, date back to the 13th century, others to the 17th. And so what does it mean to heal God? Presumably, when God withdrew, when he made space for creation, he lost many of his capacities. He became mentally debilitated, mentally ill. I think one of the capacities that God has lost, inevitably, is certainty. God cannot be certain what would happen in his creation. He set things in motion, but he no longer is in control. He, can, he cannot maintain certain. This is the uncertainty principle, yes? <laughs> this is why reality is constructed on probabilities. Because God withdrew from, from, from the world. Had God been imbued in the world, had he still been present in every molecule, everything would have been utterly deterministic. And Einstein would have been right when he talked about God and dice, yeah? But God doesn't play dice because God is no longer with us, according to Jewish mysticism. He withdrew. We are a machine set in motion. This is the Newtonian view of, of reality. We are a mas machine set in motion. And uh, it's utterly non-deterministic, indeterminate. It's uncertain. It's unpredictable even to God. Why? Because now that God has created the world, he is no longer everywhere. He is no longer the perfect, all-encompassing being that he used to be. He had to sacrifice his perfection to make us. Now, this is very profound. And I'm actually talking to you physics now, not mysticism. It's very profound because it talks about the fabric of reality. What is it? Reality is probability. Reality is potential. And again, this segues, segues to my chronon field theory. In, in my chronon field theory, I dispensed with all the certainties of, of physics. In my chronon field theory, there's no mass, no velocity, no, mo no momentum, no motion, no bodies, no, nothing. All the language that you knew that you know from physics has no trace in my work. And yet, it yields all the equations and all the predictions of all the other theories, relativity, quantum mechanics, you name it. And the, the philosophical foundation of Kron, Kron uh, field theory is to say that potentials and events are one and the same. Exactly like the wave particle duality. In my theory, there's a potential event duality. Events are potentials, reified.
Everything is potential. Even you, you are potential. You're not. The distinction between potential and reality is wrong. Reality is the potential. The minute, the minute you accept this philosophical principle, you won't believe the mathematical and physical outcomes. I mean, the, in terms of physics and mathematics. This single, simple principle. You can recreate all of physics, all uh, I and, and people I work with, I mean, I'm not alone. We succeeded to derive both relativity theories, quantum field theory, but you name it. We derived by now, after 10 years of work, we derived every known theory in physics, I, I can say. Every known theory. Even Hawking's work on, and Bekenstein's work on entropy, the fine, uh, and you name it, we did everything. And the whole theory is, Events or reality is potential. Now that sounds very <laughs> philosophical, but it's not philosophy. It's a, it's a theory in physics with very heavy mathematics and so on and so forth. It's not, uh, I'm not just babbling, you know, but this is the philosophical foundation. Well, professor, I would like to do another podcast with you just on chronon field theory. My, my pleasure. Anytime. So thank you for spending so much time with me. It's been a pleasure, truly. If people have questions about chronon field theory or they would like to learn more, I'll leave the link in the description and something will also be on screen here. Thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you for having I me. Mean, <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. Take care. Firstly, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. There's now a website, kurtjaimungle.org, and that has a mailing list. The reason being that large platforms like YouTube, like Patreon, they can disable you for whatever reason, whenever they like. That's just part of the terms of service. Now, a direct mailing list ensures that I have an untrammeled communication with you. Plus, soon I'll be releasing a one-page PDF of my top 10 toes. It's not as Quentin Tarantino as it sounds like. Secondly, if you haven't subscribed or clicked that like button, now is the time to do so. Why? Because each subscribe each like helps YouTube push this content to more people like yourself, plus it helps out Kurt directly, aka me. I also found out last year that external links count plenty toward the algorithm, which means that whenever you share on Twitter, say on Facebook or even on Reddit, etc., it shows YouTube, hey, people are talking about this content outside of YouTube, which in turn greatly aids the distribution on YouTube. Thirdly, there's a remarkably active Discord and subreddit for Theories of Everything, where people explicate toes, they disagree respectfully about theories, and build as a community our own toe. Links to both are in the description. Fourthly, you should know this podcast is on iTunes, it's on Spotify, it's on all of the audio platforms. All you have to do is type in Theories of Everything and you'll find it. Personally, I gain from re-watching lectures and podcasts. I also read in the comments that, hey, Toe listeners also gain from replaying. So how about instead you re-listen on those platforms like iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, whichever podcast catcher you use. And finally, if you'd like to support more conversations like this, more content like this, then do consider visiting patreon.com slash Mungle and donating with whatever you like. There's also PayPal. There's also crypto. There's also just joining on YouTube. Again, keep in mind, it's support from the sponsors and you that allow me to work on Toe full time. You also get early access to ad-free episodes, whether it's audio or video. It's audio in the case of Patreon, video in the case of YouTube. For instance, this episode that you're listening to right now was released a few days earlier. Every dollar helps far more than you think. Either way, your viewership is generosity enough. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. What time is it? It's time to study the chronon field theory. My name is Sam Wagner, and I'm a father of the theory. I proposed the theory in my PhD dissertation in 1984. The thesis, the PhD thesis, is available via the Library of Congress and United Microfish International, UMI, which I believe has been absorbed by uh, ProQuest but I'm not quite sure. The Cronon field theory went through two phases. Stage one, my PhD, um, and then 
30 years with no responses <laughs> and no reactions and it just went dormant and then to, about 10 years ago Eitan Suchard discovered my work and recast it in geometric terms my original thesis was algebraic and he of course developed it beyond recognition and the Cronon field theory is as much his as mine and possibly more his than mine. Today I would like to give you an overview of both my work and Sacha's work. Now, physicists would benefit from this video the most. Laymen would find it a lot more difficult, but it does contain uh, philosophical nuggets. The philosophy of Cronon field theory is very unusual. I don't want to tout my horn, but I'm getting used to it, so I would say it's groundbreaking. Okay, without further ado, to my coffee and to the Cronon field theory. In my work, Cronons are time quarks, the time elementary particles. Now, nothing's, there's nothing new about this. This has been proposed 200, 250 years ago, and numerous physicists have worked along these lines. Some of them regarded chronons as durations. Some of them regarded chronons as real particles. In my work, chronons are real particles. They are quarks. The interactions of chronons yields what we know as time. Not time with a t, a small t, which is the time measured by clocks, but time with a capital T, the concept of time, the dimension, if you wish. It is yielded by chronons interacting. Because there are various types of chronons in my work. They are like quarks, you know, up, down, etc., etc. The interactions between the various types also gives rise to the time arrow. There is a cancellation of kind going on, and what's left is the time asymmetry. Hence, the title of my work, Time Asymmetry Revisited. What about space-time? Space-time exists where the chronon wave function collapses. The space-time is an outcome of, the, of a collapse of a wave function. And the whole theory rests on a duality. You know, the basic duality in quantum mechanics is the wave-particle duality. The basic duality in chronon, chronon field theory is the potential event duality. Potentials and actual events or actualized events are facets of the same underlying unity if not entity. This duality is crucial to the development of the theory. Now, because events and potentials are one and the same in the chronon field theory, there's no particles. Particles are replaced by strings of collapse events. Particles actually are events in chronon field theory. That's why it's a time-oriented theory. Its basic building blocks are events and potentials for events rather than particles. The quantum mechanics of the theory is a quantum mechanics of events as well, not of particles. This is the introductory part. We'll go, we'll go deeper in a bit. Now, the chronon field is a field of events or perturbations, if you wish. It's a perturbative uh, uh, theory. It's a theory of perturbations. Time, with a small t, is the time measured by clocks, is the outcome of interactions in the time field, in the field of time, with a capital T. And so, chronons are both potentials and actualized events. There is an open question 
What causes the actualization? Do chronons self-actualize? Are they observer-dependent? In other words, is there a kind of Copenhagen interpretation of chronon field theory? Is there a need for an observer to collapse the wave function? Or is a collap sp collapse spontaneous, internally determined somehow? Be that as it may, the theory does not require gauge fields, as physicists among you surely have understood by now. And although gauge fields are not required, they emerge naturally in higher accelerations. Now, time space, as I said, is, a is the outcome of the collapse of a wave function. I don't know. No one can answer whether there's an, a mediation of an observer, whether the obs an observer collapses the wave function. But of course, you immediately, immediately begin, you can immediately see the religious implications. Because if the entire universe, if space-time is a collapse of a wave function, and if the collapse is dependent upon an observer, that observer, universal observer, might as well be called God. <laughs> it is ironic that an agnostic like me has led to God in his work. But, as I said, there, is, there are no assurances that the whole process is observer-mediated. What, um, what is postulated in my thesis is that all chronons uh, have been entangled at the moment of the Big Bang. There is a kind of an universal, a universe-wide entanglement of all chronons. In other words, all potentials and all actual, actualized events are entangled ab initio from the very beginning. And this is a, has enormous implications because it implies that the entire universe is essentially a quantum machine or a quantum device. And if it is, then our understanding of it currently is deeply flawed. The theory gives rise to the equivalence of uh, quantum field theories and so on and so forth. So the quantum field theory of chronon field theory is relativistic, actually, and in this sense, it's deterministic. The chronons are the field quanta, the quanta of the field. They are the excited states of the field. And the integration of everything is via quantum superpositions. It's quite a mouthful but physicists among you would surely understand. I indicated that chronon field theory is perturbative, there's perturbations. So there is a perturbative quantum field theory. Time from the Big Bang is mediated by chronons. The, there is an expansion, including an expansion of the metric. You could even conceive of, um, of the whole thing as a phonon of the metric time as a, as a phonon of the metric. And um, uh, there are many ways to look at time uh, through the chronon field uh, theory. There are no bound states in any case. The excitations that I've mentioned, the states um, of the chronons, they are stochastic perturbances. They are kinds of vibrations, if you wish. And in this sense, there's an affinity between superstring theories and chronon field theory. But as distinct from superstring theories, in chronon field theory, there's no need for extra dimensions, which render, renders chronon field theory a lot more grounded and a lot more easily falsifiable. It yields falsifiable predictions while many superstring theories um, are lacking when it comes to yielding falsifiable predictions. Now, the cumulative, uh, the cumulative perturb perturbances that I, that I mentioned create a distortion of space-time. And this is what we know as curvature. These are the basics, the philosophical basics of the 
of the theory and they've all been proposed in my PhD thesis in 1984. And then, as I said, there was a hi hiatus of about 30 years. And then Eitan Sachet, who is nothing short of a genius in my view, came on the scene. And his contributions have transformed chronon field theory. First of all, he afforded it a distinct geometric or visualization dynamic, which was missing, so totally abstract and algebraic, therefore very limited. And the second thing he did, he added numerous insights and literally transformed it beyond recognition, I would say. It's perhaps much more his work than mine. Um, such had suggested that uh, there is a universal scalar uh, field of time, but time is not a universal coordinate. He says that particles interacting within non-gravitational fields are seen as clocks whose trajectory is not Minkowski uh, geodesic. So in my work, chronons are ideal clocks and they mediate time. They are, uh, the, the relationship between chronons and time is like a relationship between the Higgs boson, uh, boson and mass. That's in my work. But in Sachet's work, um, he goes a lot deeper. And he says that a field in which a small enough clock is not geodesic can be described by a scalar field of time with non-zero curvature gradient. Scalar field, scalar field is either real, acceleration of charge matter, neutral clocks, or imaginary, acceleration of Majorana type matter clocks. Be that as it may, it preserves the scalar nature of, of uh, the scalar nature of time. Scalar field, the scalar field adds information to space time. This information is not anticipated by the metric tensor alone. And it can, the uh, time in this case cannot be realized as a coordinate because it cannot be measured from a reference submanifold along different curves. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of math in, in in this. There's manifolds and Lie algebras and so on and so forth. Those of you who would like to review the math, there's a link in the description. Click on it, and you will be exposed to my math and Aitan's Aitan Sachel's math in various papers. Uh, published in various academic journals and so on and so forth. You can down, you're invited to download them, review them off, and please alert us to any errors, any mistakes in thinking, any mistakes in calculations, and so on and so forth. We are looking forward to input. We are hungry for input, actually. So the non-geodesic alignment is attributed to electromagnetism, or electromagnetic phenomena. Both the mass and the electric charge, in this case, generate gravity. I'll come to it in a minute. It's a very controversial aspect of Eitan Sacher's work. Charge, unlike inertial mass, uh, is coupled to non-geodesic, to a non-geodesic vector field. But they both yield gravity. Again, I will come to it in a minute. So only the entire energy momentum tensor has vanishing divergence, misalignment of physically accessible events in an observer space-time, plus gravity as con a controlling response by volumetric contraction of the observer space-time in the direction where events bend or are accelerated, put together, this gives the main pillar of such as um, work. Particle, the work, such as work yields literally all of known physics from these basic assumptions mine and later his in the entire field of physics can be derived and is derived anything from particle mass ratios fine structure constant the physical meaning of of 3d foliations 
Beckenstein Hawking entropy to area constant, acceleration field strain, Q, I mean, the quantum mechanics, I mean, everything is, uh, comes, emerges naturally out of the theory, which is an, an excellent indication, I think. It's an indication that the theory is onto something and touches upon some foundational basic facet of existence, of reality. Okay, in Sacha's work, in Big Bang, in Big Bang Manifold, Field, the field is the upper limit on measurable time by interacting clocks. Yes. And from so from, he goes from each event to the singularity as a limit. And that yields fascinating outcomes. I again encourage you to go to the link in the description to download the papers and read them. They are not only mathematically sophisticated, but they are I think in all these papers, there's a lot of ph philosophical, um, how to put it without sounding too grandiose, philosophical alternatives, shall we say, which are thought-provoking, in my view. And I'm not only referring to my work, I'm actually referring mostly to Sacha's work. In the in the sitter anti sitter space-time, the reference sub-manifolds, from which time is measured along integral curves, they, they constitute all the events in which scalar field, the scalar field is zero. Matter in the Einstein-Gorsman equation is replaced by action of acceleration field, the action of, acce of the acceleration field. So it's geometric action, not foreseen by the metric alone, as I said, this is Eitan's major contribution, the geometrization of the whole of the whole thing. It's it's a theory of casual sets, in effect. Space-time exists where chronon wave the chronon wave function collapses. Particles are replaced by strings of collapse events, and there's a quantum theory of events, not of particles. Again, reverting to my original work in 1984. I mentioned that there is a part of Aton's work which is controversial, even in my eyes, and which is not mentioned in my original work, nor does it emerge from it. But Aton's geometric development of the work, plus input from many other scientists and physicists around the world, led Aton uh, to the following. There's new formation of matter in Aton's work replaces the stress energy momentum tensor. Positive charge manifests attracting gravity and stronger repelling acceleration field, which repels even uncharged particles that measure proper time. In other words, particles that have a rest mass. Negative charge manifests repelling anti-gravity and stronger acceleration field that attracts even uncharged particles. Now this of course accounts for dark matter, dark energy and, and all, but it also yields <laughs> a startling prediction about electrogravity, about the interchange between gravity and electric charge. There's even a patent granted <laughs> to Atom such as based on this um, discovery. Oh, it's very controversial and the interchange between electric charge and, and gravity is not entirely clear in my view. There's a lot more, more work to be done, but it's more robust and rigorous than one would have assumed. In other words, it breaks through the prejudices of previous mathematical theories and forces you, forces me, for example, as a physicist, to contemplate it, to think whether it's, it's true. If it is true, it's one of the greatest technological breakthroughs ever. It means that we could convert gravity to electricity and vice versa. We could develop anti-gravity and so on and so forth. I will not go into all this. It begins to sound 
a lot like science fiction. Cronon field theory is a major theoretic, theoretical reconception of physics as a way to understand reality. It dispenses with secondary properties. Everything emerges from essentially a single basic underlying assumption. Potentials are events. Everything are everything is events. There are no particles. There are only events. Quantum theory of events. Space-time is a collapse of a wave function, probability, in other words, potentials. And, and space-time as an event is also a potential because it remains um, in a superposition state until an eventual collapse. The collapse is mediated via an observer or is spontaneous and self-generating. That's besides the point. And it's it's a lot more, I would say, philosophical than, than it's a lot more philosophy than physics. But everything is about possibilities, probabilities, even events, which in classical quantum mechanics and so on and so forth, are distinguished from probabilities. Even particles, which in classical quantum mechanics and so on and so forth, are distinguished from probabilities. In chronon field theory, are, they are probabilities. Our existence, therefore, is a potential. Now, the potential manifests, becomes an actualized event, but the distinction is spur spurious and unnecessary in the chronon field theory. This single basic assumption gives rise to all of physics as we know it. While in other theories in physics, there are multiple suppositions and assumptions and entities, a multiplication of entities. Even in the simplest theories, for example, special, special relativity, or there's still half a dozen, if not a dozen entities. It's a strong indicator that something is wrong with these theory, theories. There's no parsimony. Or comes razor. A theory of everything would be based on a single principle and perhaps a single entity, for sure. Simplicity, aesthetics, beauty, symmetry are built into reality. And the chronon field theory, to the best of my knowledge, is the closest we've ever got, gotten to this, because it has a single assumption, not even an entity, just a single assumption. And yet it yields all known physics and provides falsifiable predictions. I hope it gets taken by the physics community, analyzed, possibly debunked and falsified. That's the way of science. But it deserves attention. I'm saying this not on behalf of myself. I'm far removed. I contrib my, last contribution, my last contributions have to do mostly with the mathematics of the theory. But I'm saying this on behalf of uh, science itself. I think there's a challenging idea here, and I think it should not be neglected. It should be looked into. Thank you for listening.